Hey everyone, so on the face of it, the GTX 1070 Ti here is a really easy product to describe. It offers about 90% of the power of the full fat GTX 1080, and it can be overclocked to beat the performance of the standard Founders Edition in most gaming scenarios. Now price-wise, suggested retail prices sort of sit between 1070 and 1080, so in theory, you're looking at a product that does two things. First of all, it slots within the chasm of performance between the two existing Pascal cards. And secondly, it sorts out Nvidia's issue with AMD's RX Vega 56 being a more powerful card than the 1070. But should you buy one? Well, it's a good product, but I'm not entirely sure about that. But first of all, let's talk about why exactly there's any kind of need for the 1070 Ti at all. It's all about what I'm going to be calling the power band, defined by the 1070 and the 1080. Now, many games can be used to illustrate the issue here, but I'm going to be using Ghost Recon Wildlands at 1440p here because A, it's historically been an NVIDIA-centric game, and B, pushed to ultra settings, it's a monstrous GPU workout. GTX 1080, basically 21% faster than the 1070. But now, let's slot in Vega 56 and 64. By and large, the 64 is just a tad slower than the 1080. But for much of the bench, the two cards are on level pegging. The 56, meanwhile, well, that's about 6% ahead of the 1070. So basically then, if 1080 and 1070 define the top and the bottom of the performance range, both Vega products sit in between. Now, let's add 1070 Ti. It's not quite as fast as Vega 64, but it beats out the challenge of the 56, and yeah, it pretty much sits right between the 1070 and the 1080, exactly as it was designed to do. So how has this been achieved then? Well, it's clearly a companion card to the 1070 and the 1080, built on much the same technology. Physically, it's very close to the existing Founders Edition cards here, and it's a match in terms of looks for the 1080, and it retains the same shell, the same vapor chamber cooler, the same 8-pin power input, only this time you don't have to pay a premium for this particular design. In fact, it's the cheapest 1070 Ti you can buy. Inside, though, there are technological aspects of both the 1070 and the 1080 kind of merged into one, making it a sort of Frankenstein's monster of a card, if you like, a hybrid. First up, let's consider the compute power here. We have 2432 shaders, a big upgrade over 1070's 1920. And that is 95% of the 1080's 2560 shaders. There's a slight drop in clocks, but nothing that's going to noticeably impact performance. Memory, and more specifically bandwidth specs. Well, you can see that we're getting bog standard GDDR5 memory here, imported from the 1070, not the lovely G5X of the 1080. The end result is a drop in bandwidth compared to the 1080, 20% in fact. With that kind of variation between those two core components, you'd expect different games to post different results. But by and large, 1070 Ti always sort of sticks in the middle there. And as a tweener card, this is enough to beat off the challenge of the Vega 56 in a great many titles. So here it is in Rise of the Tomb Raider, running under DX12. Again, you can see the top and lower bounds of the power ladder defined by 1080 and 1070. And within that, there's Vega 56 and 1070 Ti. The new NVIDIA card delivering a nice 16% performance bump over 1070 and a 7% uptick over Vega 56. But what the 1070 Ti doesn't really do is address the titles where Vega actually performs really well, above its kind of trending average. The gap narrows in the division running under DX11 to just 4.7%, even though the 1070 Ti's performance skews closer to 1080 levels here. Meanwhile, in the Far Cry Primal benchmark, the 1070 Ti starts off looking pretty strong against the Vega 56, but the more you carry on through the benchmark, the more Vega 56 rallies, and by the end of the sequence, the Ti is just 2.3% faster. And there's a similar result in The Witcher 3 here. As we look at the sequence here, Vega 56 and 1070 Ti are essentially tied, but small sections across the bench do run a touch faster on the Nvidia side, but the end result is just a 3% advantage for the green team here. And of course, there are titles out there that simply prefer AMD hardware, where Vega 56 isn't 
a million miles away from GTX 1080 performance. So let's take a look at Battlefield 1 performance here at ultra settings, running under DX12, and again, like all the benchmarks here, 1440p resolution. Now, to be fair, this title does run better on NVIDIA under DX11, but even so, in an apples to apples comparison on the newer API, the result is clear. Vega 56 is faster than the 1070 Ti across the run of play. And this kind of leads us on to the main issue I've been struggling with with this new product, pricing. As a card that compares directly with Vega 56, we have a bit of an issue here because the 1070 Ti is actually more expensive than the Radeon offering in terms of suggested retail pricing. Now, supply and demand has caused issues for AMD leading to price hikes, but it's not impossible to get a Vega 56 at the MSRP now. But more than that, it's the fact that GTX 1070 Ti is kind of selling at its suggested price while prices can fluctuate pretty dramatically on the 1070 and the 1080. So in the UK, I've been taking a look at this, 1070 Ti prices, 420 to 440 pounds. However, I've seen the excellent factory overclock Strix 1070 at just 360 and third-party 1080s at 440 to 460. So here's how the Strix 1070 compares to the Founders Editions for both 1070 and 1070 Ti. Yeah, there's a relatively small uptick on the Strix, but still, it's eating into that lead offered by Ti stock performance. And those 1080s out there, you're likely to see a similar incremental bump if they have factory overclocks, and many of them do. Now, maybe these are time-limited deals on the older cards, but it is a market reality, and combined with Vega 56's price point and competitiveness, this starts to make the case for the GTX 1070 Ti a little harder to justify. It's a new product with a relatively set price thrust into a more liquid market, and comparisons with GTX 1070 and 1080 can be a bit tricky, bearing in mind that these cars are like 18 months old now. Still great products, of course, but older technology is naturally prone to more aggressive pricing. I'll return to this positioning in the market in a bit, but let's talk overclocking right now because it's not exactly difficult to push the 1070 Ti up to and beyond 1080 performance in many cases. So I can add 200 megahertz to the core and 500 megahertz to the GDDR5 memory here. And the change in the grouping with the Nvidia cards is fascinating. 1070 Ti typically occupies the midpoint between 1070 and 1080 at stock settings. But in this Crisis 3 test, you can see that the Ti is essentially on par or even a bit faster than the 1080 in certain areas of the benchmark. Now, remember when I was talking about the power band defined by 1080 at the top and 1070 at the bottom? Well, the Ti sort of propels its way up to pole position here with the overclock in place. And the same thing happens here in the GPU intensive Assassin's Creed Unity. 1070 Ti matches the 1080 point for point and occasionally moves slightly ahead. However, some titles really do like memory bandwidth and the end result is that the stock 1080 can retain its lead in some scenarios. You can see that here in The Witcher 3, a game that loves memory bandwidth, whether we're talking GPU or CPU. The overclock isn't quite enough to take the 1070 Ti clear, but it is in the majority of titles. Now, overclocking is simple and it's not dangerous, but with the Founders Edition card here, things get toasty and the fans need to be ramped up manually. It's not a fantastic cooler, to be honest, and I would recommend third-party alternatives. But again, the issue there, well, you're going to be paying more for them, meaning that you are propelling yourself closer to GTX 1080 pricing. And of course, let's not forget that that 1080 can be overclocked as well. Now, the chances are that pricing will settle down according to market conditions in the fullness of time, in which case I fully expect the 1070 Ti to kind of find its place. But for now, I think the point to make is that, well, the 1070 Ti isn't inherently a bad product. Of course not. It's a 1080 with the tiniest of cutbacks paired up with 1070 RAM. It's designed to fit between the two and offer overclocking options. And that is exactly what has been delivered. It's a Pascal card too, meaning that Power Draw is way, way better than Vega. And the FE model only requires a single 8-pin power input, so it will integrate into more systems easily. Generally, it is faster than the Vega 56, but the value win here isn't clear cut. And I kind of think that was supposed to be the key aim of the product existing in the first place. 
More than that though, the Pascal GP104 processor within the 1070 Ti, well, it is 18 month old technology now. Just how long will we have to wait until the next gen Volta? If we see performance versus price increases, as we saw with Pascal, 1070 Ti here could start to look quite old within six months of purchase. This is not to say that the 1070 Ti isn't a great product in the here and now. I mean, there's always something better just around the corner, isn't there? But as good as it is, there's nothing revolutionary here. It's very good, but it's not a no brainer. Okay, so I think I'm gonna leave it right there. As always, do like and subscribe to support the work we do here at Digital Foundry. And of course, follow us on Twitter for the latest DF updates. But that's all from me for now. Thanks for watching.